uh, great scientists often leave a legacy, not only in the science they've done, but also uh, in their students uh, who grow up to become the next generation of great scientists. Uh, one of those who um, left a rich legacy of, uh, new, of younger generation uh, astronomers uh, is Andy Fabian. And we are here uh, happy to have his former student, Irene uh, uh, Cara. She got her PhD from K University of Cambridge in 2015. And she told me now for, even from St. John's College, which is, uh, of course, the best college in Cambridge. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> um, after that, she was Hubble Fellow at the University of Maryland and Goddard Space Flight Center. And from 2019, she's been assistant professor in the physics department and at the Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Science at MIT. Uh, from the American Astronomical Society, she has this year received the Newton Lacey Pierce Prize for outstanding achievement over the past five years in observational astronomical research. So we are very happy here to uh, welcome Irene and uh, with Black Hole Echo Mapping. All right, thank you. Uh, I will continue on talking about some of the research that we've been doing in the past few years on looking at uh, the innermost regions of black holes closest to the event horizon that we can probe and uh, using a technique that we call X-ray reverberation mapping that Andy kind of hinted at at the end of his talk and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we are really doing in this technique and uh, some of these re the recent, most recent results. And following on from uh, Connie's nice uh, show of the, the uh, you know, he hearing the acoustic oscillations and translating that into sound, uh, at the end I will tell you a little bit about uh, our work on, on translating these light echoes that we observe around black holes into, into sound. So stay tuned for that. Okay. So Andy told us about how these black holes, these supermassive black holes sitting at the centers of galaxies are not just these simple ornamental little, little uh, you know, point masses at the center of this massive galaxy. And what we now understand is actually these black holes can release copious amounts of energy that affect very large scales uh, in the galactic environments and can even change how that galaxy evolves, right? And so we've seen, we call this AGN feedback, that the, the process of shoving material into a black hole can produce things like these, uh, these relativistic jets that you can see sometimes even punching out and creating holes in the, in the surrounding medium, or objects like 3C273 uh, that Andy highlighted that's uh, you know, uh, you know, so much brighter than, so much more luminous than, uh, than individual stars. Uh, and we now know that that's powered from material falling into the, the innermost regions uh, past, the event horizon of, uh, past the event horizon of the black hole. So the question that we want to ask is, how is all of this energy released? How do we create this copious amounts of radiation that we observe? How do we produce these relativistic jets? Uh, and how does this process of material flowing inwards lead to the projection of these, uh, these jets? And the key is that you know, most of the energy that's being released in these systems is happening within you know, the innermost regions, within 10, 20 gravitational radii of the black hole. So very close to the, the event horizon of the black hole. And so what we're trying to do is kind of what is it, understand what does it look like in those very close environments uh, near the, to the black hole. So of course uh, we know that you know if you, imaging is is the is is what we would all love to be able to do, uh, and Jeff Bauer is here from the Event Horizon Telescope uh, collaboration, and he will tell us about these amazing images uh, of M87 and Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And what you can see is what they're doing is taking. We see these relativistic jets in some of these objects, and if we can probe down on smaller and smaller scales, spatial scales, then we can get down to event horizon scales around the black hole. And that's an amazing feat, an amazing technological feat that we'll hear uh, more about. Uh, and it's really important for understanding these populations of black holes that are not actively accreting very much uh, material. 
What we also want to understand on the other side of the um, kind of uh, accretion spectrum is we want to understand also those black holes that are very luminous, that are really a lot of material is flowing into them. And when we look at those objects, their innermost regions are extremely dense uh, and we can't image them. The Event Horizon Telescope can't image them uh, directly. In fact, no telescope can, can image them directly. And so when we actually look at our data, this is what they look like. Uh, this is a real observation, an X-ray observation of a supermassive black hole. Uh, and you can see it, it looks pretty um, puny. And, but that's really not the exciting thing. What we, so we don't have any spatial information. Uh, we cannot image these event horizon scales. And all that we really have is the energy of the photons coming from, from, the, that black, from around that black hole and the arrival time of those photons at our detector. And from those two parameters, the energy of the photon and the arrival time uh, of that photon at our detector, we want to reconstruct images like this. And this is uh, from the movie Interstellar, you know, a beautiful kind of ray tracing simulation where they've taken, you know, this is what we think light, you know, take a gas, uh, a disk of material, and you put it around a black hole and you see all of these, uh, the rays would be bent around the black hole. And this is the kind of things that we infer or we want to infer from these point sources where we have the arrival time and the energy of the photon. And so this is the goal of this black hole reverberation mapping, this echo mapping, is to use echoes of X-ray light that are reflecting, that are bouncing off of gas flows near to the black hole to reconstruct uh, what it must look like in these environments close to the black hole. So how do we actually uh, do this? I'll go a little bit into the technique. Um, so, but, you know, just as a kind of you know, taking a, a zeroth order approach to things, I think we all kind of understand the idea of echo mapping. Uh, this is something, you know, bats use echolocation. Uh, and, you know, for, I, I really like this particular um, plot because it shows uh, sound echoes. And, you know, this is like a, a diagram, maybe I am here, this bullhorn speaking to you now, and here you are. Uh, maybe in your tuxedo from Tuesday night's banquet. And if I, you know, give a, a, a quick just impulse of a sound, you hear some of the, that sound directly to, to you, right? But you also hear reflections, echoes off of these walls, right? So if we can plot this, there's some direct impulse of a sound, and if we were able to measure all of the echoes, not just ones that bounce one time, but maybe bounce several times, if we're able to map all of those echoes, what we call the, res the response of the room, and because we, know, we can measure that time delay, and we know that those uh, sound waves are traveling at, us at the speed of sound, then we can basically completely map out what this room looks like without e imaging it at all. Right? And so that's the basic idea of what we're doing with reverberation mapping uh, in, in, in uh, not now with sound, but now with light. And so I'll go back and just play this uh, one more time. What I'm showing you here is this very simple schematic of the innermost, what we think that the innermost regions look like, uh, where you have this accretion disk. This is kind of a cross section of an accretion disk that's rotating around that central black hole. And we have this primary source of X-ray emission. This is going to be the impulse, you know, that clap uh, at, the, at the beginning of that uh, plot that you saw here. So you have some impulse of X-ray photons from this corona. That corona uh, is this hot plasma of, of electrons that produces high energy uh, X-rays. Uh, it may be related to the base of the jet, and we'll talk more about that. And the, those photons emit kind of isotropically in all directions. And we see some of those photons directly, but we also see, going back, 
Yeah, those photons, some of those photons will irradiate the accretion disk, and we see some delayed response of the disk. So we call this the reflection spectrum, and I would say this is one of Andy's biggest contributions to the field, is, is understanding that you could use this reflection spectrum as a, diagnos uh, a diagnostic of the inner accretion flow. But what do we actually mean by um, reflection? It's not, of course, like a, it's not like reflection like a mirror, but you know, one of the, the, the it's, it's lots of atomic processes happening in this um, irradiated accretion disk. And one of those uh, processes is, the, is uh, fluorescence, where you'll have some photon coming in. It excites an, uh, an ion to an, uh, an electron to an, a higher energy level. And as that, uh, that de-excitation process happens, you get an emitted line at a particular energy range, right? Of course, this, um, this you know, that's what the process that would happen if you irradiate a static slab of gas. But we're talking about this rotating accretion disk around a black hole. And as Andy described, you see, then see a combination of Doppler shifts of the line, um, uh, special relativistic effects, and general relativistic effects as those um, photons try to climb out of that, get stretched as they climb out of the strong potential well around the black hole. And so what we actually observe is this is what the, this fluorescence line and other Compton scattering um, would look like in, uh, for a static slab of gas. And of course, you put that around this rotating uh, black hole, uh, a rotating accretion disk, and you see all of these shifted, broadened effects that you can use um, then to kind of reconstruct uh, both like, this, for instance, the inclination of the disk, that'll change the amount of Doppler shifts that you're seeing, or the, the spin of the black hole uh, will, will um, change the inner edge of that accretion disk where you see that in, uh, innermost stable circular orbit so you can measure the spin of the black hole. So now, implicit in this kind of picture where you have this corona and the reflection, you expect that in, you know, within this energy spectrum here, that there should be a time delay, that the, the fluorescence lines and these reflection features should be delayed with respect to the continuum, the primary source of emission. Uh, so this is what we're looking to observe. And one more complicated uh, aspect of, is that, of this is, you know, Unlike the example that I gave at the beginning where we have some easy impulse, a single impulse uh, that, that would be easy to track its echo across the disk, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't know, uh, black, hole, black holes are, these accretion disks are producing uh, radiation that is stochastically variable. You see the, the brightness over time is varying uh, over, over timescales of you know, millions of years down to timescales of uh, hours in these supermassive black hole systems. And so instead of just getting an impulse of light, you have something going crazy. And so it can be challenging then to find where that actually that echo is. Uh, and so sometimes you're lucky and you can see these directly in, by eye when you look at a light curve, uh, that brightness as a function of time, that you can see, maybe you can see, this is actual data, where you're seeing the primary source uh, light curve in blue, an energy band that is dominated by that corona um, primary emission. And in red, you're seeing an energy band that's dominated by that reflected component, that reflection and you can see a little bit that by eye, uh, you can see that the reflected component is delayed with respect to the continuum. And so that's kind of a, a nice confirmation when you actually can see it by eye in the data. Uh, in principle, uh, we are not doing the analysis like this, and I didn't want to go too much into Fourier transforms uh, in, this, in this talk, but I should have known that with the astro seismologists and the, uh, the previous speakers, we would have been, all been pros at Fourier transforms by now. Um, but this is essentially what we're, what we're doing, that we're looking at different uh, timescales of the, these variability components, and we're looking for lags and leads between different energy bands. And we can use um, the information of those different lags uh, and leads to kind of uh, measure these reverberation echoes. 
So this is a, kind of an example of, of, of you know, after you, you know, you, you've done this Fourier analysis, so you've isolated the, the, uh, the, the time scale of variability that you're most interested in, and you see uh, uh, something like this. So this is uh, data from uh, a, a black hole, a supermassive black hole again, and, you're, and on the left, this, I'm showing the, the energy spectrum, and again, you see uh, one is basically telling you where that primary source of emission, uh, the primary emission is from that corona, the direct emission. And you see this relativistically broadened uh, IRK band and this characteristic Compton scattering hump, these reflected features. And what we're seeing when we take these exact same data, and now we look at when, do, when is the arrival time of those, you know, when are we seeing that signal uh, at different times? We see that the bands where we are dominated by these reflection components, we're seeing that those are delayed with respect to uh, the, the zero continuum, that primary source. And so if you were to do the most naive thing, which you should not do, but you know, just to give you a kind of a, a, a zeroth order approach of things, you see, okay, we're seeing that this iron K fluorescence line is lagging the continuum by 400 seconds. I know that that is associated with a light travel time distance. And so we can say, okay, then we are probing scales, we're reverberation mapping scales uh, to this precision, and, or to this level. And that's about the, the, the Earth uh, Sun radius that we're seeing. And you compare that, now this is for a four, uh, you know, a several billion, a million time, uh, times, the, the, a black hole that's several million times the mass of the sun, uh, in units of gm over c squared, if you're f comfortable with gravitational radii, we're talking about, uh, about 10, uh, 10 gravitational radii from the black hole. So really close to the event horizon of the black hole, the innermost regions. And especially when you compare that to the size of the galaxy, uh, we're talking about extremely small scales. So this is actually, you know, I wouldn't say we're resolving uh, you know, the, these black holes, because of course this is not direct imaging, uh, but these are probing spatial scales that are even uh, out of reach of the Event Horizon Telescope. So, uh, so that's kind of where the state of the field, uh, you know, when I first started my PhD at, at the University of Cambridge, um, reverberation, I started in 2011, reverberation mapping had been observed in one source uh, using a telescope that had been in orbit for a decade at that point, uh, and it was just that we had Phil Etley, a collaborator, uh, kind of realized that we could, you know, basically do this, you know, analyze the data in a different way using these Fourier timing techniques and back out these reverberation lags. And, but we had this, a wealth of data, like 10 years of data from this telescope that we could go back and look at. And so when Andy kind of approached me with this, with this thesis idea, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm in, let's, let's go for it. So um, when I started, somebody told me like early on, I'm, I'm really actually very grateful that I didn't know that Andy was as big a deal as he is. <laughs> I would have been totally intimidated. But you know, I was there for you know, a few months and it, it became clear. Somebody said, you know, you're like Andy's 56th student or something like that. And, and I always, I asked Andy at some point like, how do you keep track of all of our projects? And, and he said like, uh, something that I'll, I'll never forget and I use also now with my own students. He said, if you give your students your best ideas, your best projects, then you'll always be excited to work with them. And I thought that's kind of really also what I try to do now in, in my work is, you know, I'm, I, that's my favorite part of my job is working with my students and it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. So Andy, uh, kind of a year into my time in Cambridge, he gave me this data set of IRAS 13224, another supermassive black hole. Uh, it was a great XMM observation, and he said, you know, like, let's see what we can, if we can find some reverberation lags. Uh, and it was a, I think this was kind of one, one of my most exciting moments early on in my career uh, was making this uh, discovery. Actually, Andy was away on vacation, and uh, I had this kind of moment where I looked at the data and found something kind of new, and I like couldn't wait for him to come back uh, from vacation so I could tell him about it. But the, I, I won't go into all the details, but again, this is the lag as a function of temporal frequency. And what I noticed was that when 
you looked at the source during when it was in a very low luminosity state compared to when it was in a very high luminosity state, you saw the frequency at which this reverberation lag occurs would change with the luminosity of the source. And so we were able to see that in the low flux state, uh, the lags were shorter. And that was saying that the corona must be more compact. And so these reverberation echoes that you measure are shorter uh, in the low flux state. And so this was kind of a, an early indication that the size of the corona scales with the luminosity of the, of the, black, uh, of the source. Of course, like a PhD process, uh, thesis is, is not all peachy, uh, and there are times when you really struggle as well, and uh, I just I wanted to, have another kind of point that I always remember, one time when, you know, one of the things that I really remember, uh, one time feeling uh, when things were not going so well. I think we all kind of appreciate that when you're doing, when you're like, you know, at the edge of what we know, you can pretty much guarantee that you're gonna have some really hard moments <laughs> in your research, right? You're gonna have times when you feel like uh, a lack of confidence in the result uh, or like that you're know, really struggling. And, and one of those times Andy came to my desk and he took a piece of paper and he said, physics research is often like a damped harmonic oscillator, right? <laughs> that you have, you, that you can think of this uh, as like your confidence, your enthusiasm for this idea that you have, this research result. And you get really excited and really gung-ho about it. And then you find that you crash at some point and you struggle at some point or you doubt that you've done something right in the analysis. And at, at some point you come to some like, all right, now I'm ready to to publish this result. And hopefully this is offset from zero, um, but in most of the time it, it is. All right, so, you know, after that first analysis of IRS 13224, um, this kind of excited us and Andy kind of initiated, well, let's, this is an extremely amazing object where we were able to see this flux dependent lag in, in, in kind of two states, but let's get a longer observation. This was 1.5 megaseconds because X-ray astronomers for some reason use seconds as the unit of exposure. This is like 17 days of observations, the longest exposure of a single bl black hole with this telescope. Uh, and we got these observations uh, to take this reverberation picture from a snapshot of two flux states into a movie. And so what we were able to do, Will Alston, a collaborator of ours, was able to find that the, the inferred height of the corona uh, inferred from these reverberation echoes scales with the luminosity uh, of, the black, uh, of, the, of the source. And if you can understand the geometry uh, well enough, then you can use these light echoes to make a measurement of the mass of the black hole. So one of these fundamental parameters of black holes. So now I want to tell you about what I consider to be um, kind of the, the next step in all of this is um, one of the most exciting prospects is uh, going beyond supermassive black holes, but kind of then going down to the smallest scales of black holes as well. Uh, and we can now measure these reverberation lags in stellar massive black holes that are in a binary system with a, uh, a normal star companion that's accreting material off of that companion star. The reverberation echoes in these sources will scale with the mass of the black hole. So instead of you know hundreds of seconds of reverberation echoes, now we're looking at you know sub millisecond echoes. So how do we do that? We need uh, new technologies. But first, let me go. I'll tell you a little bit about why we care about these black hole X-ray binaries, these companion systems. We can think of them. Uh, I like to think of them as, you know, the reason I'm interested in them is that they really are these scaled-down supermassive black holes. And if we want to understand the causal connection between material flowing into the black hole and producing these relativistic jets, uh, we can do this, you know, on, on human timescales. We can see material flowing in the beginning uh, of an outburst, and then at some point in this outburst, we see these ballistic jets that are being launched. Uh, we can track them in the radio. Uh, and, uh, and you can actually see, you know, probe this causal connection uh, on, time, on time scales you know, of, a, of a PhD thesis or less. So why were we able to kind of make this leap into studying these really rapid timescale um, light echoes? 
Uh, well, this is thanks to the NICER Observatory. This is a, an X-ray telescope that is on the International Space Station. So you see the this is sped up by like 60 times. Uh, you see the solar panels in the background there. This is Canada Arm. And NICER is about the size of a washing machine. And it's this amazing uh, X-ray concentrator optics. And it's, it has no imaging capability at all, really. Uh, but it's a, it's a huge light bucket with like very fast uh, time resolution. And because we are looking at these point sources that we wouldn't be able to resolve anyway, all we really need is that high throughput. We want to collect lots of photons at, with great uh, timing precision. And uh, a few years ago, we were kind of uh, for fortunate that one of these stellar mass black holes in our galaxy went into outburst. And it was picked up by another, uh, this is a Japanese instrument on the International Space Station called MAXI, that's kind of wide field of view looking for transients in the sky. Uh, and after this transient MAXI J1820 was picked up, NICER quickly slewed and t basically took observations every day for, for the next several months throughout that outburst. Uh, and so we were excited that you know, we were able to measure these reverberation echoes uh, in this source. I won't go into all of the details, but they were the shortest e reverberation echoes that we had ever been able to do in an X-ray binary. And we were able to also see how that you know, evolves over uh, the evolution of this outburst. And so this uh, helped us, I won't go into the details, but it helped us solve a long-standing debate on the on the truncation radius of the inner accretion disk, um, and we were excited to get the cover of nature. So now, where are we going uh, next? Well, uh, what the results that I showed you from MAXI J1820 was just one source, uh, but uh, my PhD student, Jingyi Wang, uh, we decided that she, she, we, were, we would build a, an automated tool for, for searching the entire NICER data archive of all the low-mass X-ray binaries and to see how many new sources of reverberation that we could find. And with this, uh, what we call the reverb machine, um, Xingyi increased the sample of known X-ray binaries uh, with reverberation lags from three to now 11. And that, so this is a kind of a huge uh, step forward in our understanding and we can see you know, that what we saw in one source, now we we've, uh, kind of see actually in, in all of these sources. Uh, and the key here is, without going into too many details, is that we see in these outbursts that they start uh, we, we can plot their luminosity and their spectral shape. And so uh, on the right side of this uh, diagram, is a, is the, the spectral shape is very dominated by this, the corona is extremely bright. And all of the sources start with a, a very strong coronal emission. And then at some point in their outburst, several weeks to months, they transition to a state where they're very dominated by the disk emission. And what Jingyi found is that the, in all of these sources where you measure reverberation lags, uh, during this state transition from the corona-dominated to the disk-dominated state, the lags get an order of magnitude larger. And that was surprising to see that in one source. And then to see it in the rest really kind of confirmed that this is indeed a real uh, effect. What's interesting is that during this state transition, we've known for many years uh, that you, you will see, if you have high cadence radio observations, you can see radio flares happening. And if you track those radio uh, data for, with VLBI that we'll hear about in Jeff's talk, uh, sometimes you can see relativistic blobs, relativistically moving uh, ejecta from um, in the, close to the black hole that move out um, at superluminal uh, motions. And so what we were able to, what we kind of are inferring from this is that perhaps what we're seeing with these longer uh, reverberation lags, this is like the last hurrah of the corona, that the corona expands uh, to much greater sizes, something is ejected, uh, and if this corona is really the base of the jet, then it's the corona is, is expanding to larger scales, uh, and that can propagate downstream further out uh, at larger distances that you can actually see these uh, ejecta moving out uh, and producing the synchrotron emission in the radio.
So this is uh, kind of where we're going uh, in this field, and we're trying to connect these large scales that you observe uh, in the radio uh, further out in the jet to the smallest scales closest to the jet launching region. Um, so now, in the last just few moments of this uh, talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about you know, this, some of this recent work on, this is kind of something that's been a side pet project, an idea that I had um, for, for a while now, and then during uh, uh, the pandemic, I, I kind of reached out to a few colleagues at MIT. One of the awesome things about being at MIT is like you have all these technically minded, even the people in the humanities departments are all like into like cool coding and stuff. And it's like, it's just, they're really excited to, uh, so, to work on, on these uh, new ideas, uh, kind of br bridging, uh, you know, STEM fields and, and uh, the arts. So Ian Condry is uh, uh, in the music department. Kyle Keane is, uh, in, is uh, an educator in, in working on inclusive pedagogy, how to kind of work with, um, you know, bringing, uh, bringing the sciences, bringing tools to um, uh, f folks with disabilities, including most, uh, mostly blind um, students. Uh, and so what we, what, the idea was that, you know, often I would give a, a public lecture about reverberation echoes, and I would use, as you saw, this uh, diagram of this impulse and response from uh, of sound echoes. And actually, like, if you plot, this is an actual ray tracing simulation of uh, reverberation echo off of a, an accretion disk near a black hole, you have some impulse of light now, and this is just a, a, like a delta function flash of radiation from that corona. And then we can, you know, it, it irradiates that disk, and you can see the response of the disk. And it, it's actually kind of awesome how it looks so similar to the, the, the sound impulse response function. So when you have like a, a, one of these ray tracing simulations, you have that impulse of, of light. Uh, what you'll see first, you know, the, are the, some of those photons will hit the near side of, the, if the disk is inclined like this, you'll see photons from the near side of the disk because it's closer to you, right? And then you see photons from the far side of the disk that get bent over into our line of sight, right? And so that's what you're seeing uh, here, the front side of the disk, and then the second peak is the back side of the disk. And then as those, uh, those photons then you know, hit larger and larger radii, that produces this long tail of the outer, outer disk. And so I asked them, uh, these folks, and working with Michal Dovchek, another uh, astrophysicist, uh, taking these GR ray tracing simulations and converting them into these sound echoes. And so, um, you know, we, we all, I'm going to play for you these sound echoes, uh, and uh, we, we released them during Black Hole Week uh, as part of a press release for Jingyi's uh, reverb machine, and it was picked up by the New York Times, which is like my biggest, you know, moment. Dennis Overby wrote about our work in the, in the New York Times, uh, and the coolest thing was that I, I said um, that, you know, what I was really excited about in these sonifications was that you can hear the general relativity. Uh, you can hear the, the, the sound being being uh, stretched to longer wavelengths. And he said, I, I said that, to, I told him that, and he said, eat your hearts out, Pink Floyd. So that was, that was a pretty cool moment. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna play for you these simulations. Uh, and I have two simulations that you'll see. One on the left is for a 30 degree inclination, so it's a more face-on system. And then on the right, I'll play next, is more edge-on. And so what you're gonna see uh, is in the more edge-on case, this is where you see the maximum like Doppler shifts uh, happening. And you also, there's gonna be more light that's being kind of bent around from the backside of the black hole. Uh, and so listen for, for those effects. What you, so basically all that we've done is to take, uh, you know, you have some, in the rest frame there would be some tone but then there's going to be, those tones are going to be stretched um, because of like the Doppler shift and the, the general relativistic effects. So listen for, when, when, you, when I say I could hear the general relativity, I meant that you can hear uh, the tone, uh, there's a delayed low tone. 
and that's because those photons uh, coming reprocessed off of the inner edge of the accretion disk will be the most gravitationally redshifted, and they'll also be the ones that are, because of the Shapiro delay, they'll be the most delayed as well. So take, try to listen for, um, for those, the, the different tones. All right, and so I, again, also, let me just, one more thing to preface, I know I'm building this up. Um, what you're seeing is a flash of light from the, uh, fr you won't see the flash of light, but it's happened, and all you're seeing is the, the response of the disk as those uh, waves, those light waves propagate out. So this is for the face-on system. So did you hear the general relativity? Okay. And you notice that you saw the first, the, the front side of the disk and then the, 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 the far side. And now we'll do it for the more edge on system. So similar, but uh, slightly different. And then the back side. So cool, kind of spooky. Okay. So that's all that I wanted to tell you about today. Uh, thank you for um, your attention. Um, I, I hope that I've convinced you that these black hole, hole echoes are a, a great way of probing the innermost regions around these luminous accreting black holes. Uh, they can help us measure the mass and spin fundamental parameters of the black hole uh, and understand more about uh, you know, the jet launching region close to the, the black hole. And I really think um, sonification is a, an exciting way to engage with the, the public and beyond, and um, I hope that we can use these in, in, in new and exciting ways. So thank you. I'll take any questions.